The book of Philippians, chapter 1. That is on page, I'll tell you in a second. 1229. All right. Starting at verse 18. It says, But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will churn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain." If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, Again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for all you have given to us, Lord. And right now, as we study your word, I pray you will open our minds and our hearts, Lord, to receive what you are going to tell us this morning. And I thank you in your name. Amen. So... um, to kind of reiterate what Jay said this morning, if you haven't, if you weren't here last week and you didn't hear his sermon, or if you were, were here last week and you want to hear it again, I highly recommend you, you listen to that sermon. It, it was a challenging one, and if you practice, put into practice what, what Jay challenged us with, I guarantee you'll, you'll see some amazing changes in your life. And uh, last Sunday, when he started the sermon, he started off with a, a short video about uh, six missionaries who were martyred uh, for spreading the gospel to the Alca people in Ecuador. And one of those missionaries uh, was Jim Elliott, and the video started off with a quote from him, and that quote says this, says, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Just think about that. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. See, this this saying shows that Jim Elliott, that he had a great view of eternity. He knew what it meant to die and be with Christ forever. He had the right perspective when it came to his life here on this earth. It showed that he was more concerned about the things of heaven, right, than about the things that can so easily ensnare us here on this earth. In Jim's diary, he also said this. It says, God, I pray to you, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn for you. Consume my life, God, for it is yours. And then later on in his diary, he also says this. It says, I seek not a long life, but a full life, like that of Jesus Christ. Now, as we know the story, Jim's prayer was answered. He did not have a long life. He gave up his life spreading the gospel to the Alka people. The sacrifice of his life became a launching point, though, for the tribe to come to know Christ. His life was like Christ. It was not long, but it was full of life. Jim lived in view of eternity. And I would even say that maybe Jim would do the same thing again, knowing the outcome that it had. See, now, I I often try to keep a view of eternity, an eternal perspective, but I have to admit to you, it is kind of difficult. 
at times. Why? Because the, the distractions of this world, they easily pull me away from what it really means. Now, wouldn't it be great to not have that problem, to not be ensnared by the world, to always have an eternal perspective where you can see that everything that happens to you from the pleasant to the not so pleasant to the downright evil things in this world, that they somehow can be used for God's glory. To have that perspective, I, th I think, would be a blessing. Do, do you know anyone who's like that? That when, that when life throws them for a loop, they just go on with it and they just roll with it. And, and instead of complaining, they seize the opportunity to spread the good news. Do you know anybody like that? These people live in constant view of eternity. One of those people in my life is, is my mother. And when, when I was growing up, she was almost annoyingly so in constant view of eternity. Where everything I did and said was like, well, you know, when you die, I'm like, okay, mom, I know. Everything you learn here is a lesson. This is all set from God. I know, mom. <laughs> but now when I look back at it, it's true. Everything that I've gone through has prepared me for something to be used by God greater. Everything, from, from the bad things to the good things. And my mom still reminds me of that through, through emails and phone calls. But Paul, in these verses, he, he gives us some clues on how to have an eternal perspective. See, how can you go about in your life keeping Christ first. Paul kind of shows us. He gives us a glimpse here. In verses 18 to 20, Paul speaks about his rejoicing. So it kind of starts off with shock because remember, at this point, Paul is in prison where he is writing words and these words and he's saying that he is rejoicing. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be rejoicing in any prison. Now, remember, Paul wasn't in some nice, comfy American prison. He was in a Roman prison, so it was dirty, dingy. He didn't bathe, probably rats running around him. Yet, he is rejoicing. Now, how is that? Is, is it because maybe he knew that something good was going to happen around the corner? There, there was good news coming his way. He was about to be released. Paul didn't know any of these things. He didn't, he didn't know if he was going to be released, if he was going to be tried and accused falsely, or he, or he didn't know if he was even put to death. Yet, he's still rejoicing. See, I think Paul could rejoice because Christ was first in his life. He found his identity in Christ. His priority was on Jesus. He didn't have foolish optimism that so many of us have, right? I know for me, I, a lot of times I base my optimism on how much money's in the bank. Oh, I'm good this month. I got enough money to pay the bills, right? Or maybe we say, oh, man, I really hope this politician gets elected because then everything will be good, right? We have optimism based on things that can quickly change. Well, Paul's optimism was based on Jesus Christ, who never changes. Paul said, I can rejoice because he knew his hope was in God, Paul's attitude was right, not because of the circumstances, but because his focus was on Jesus Christ. The first point, Paul had an eternal perspective through prayer. Now, the first thing that Paul asked for here is prayer. This, to me, is kind of amazing, because he's asking the Philippian Christians for prayer for himself. And this is the Apostle Paul, which... I'm sure if the Apostle Paul walked into this room, I would be asking him for prayer. But he would probably turn right around and ask for me to pray for him. Why? Because Paul knew that there was nothing he could accomplish on his own, but only through the prayers of brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? We have to admit that without prayer, we really can't do anything in the power of Christ. We constantly need prayer. Another, uh, my mom, I know she's always praying for me. Every time we have an issue in our house, I call my mom, mom, one of the kids are sick, can you pray for them? I know she's praying immediately. She's a prayer warrior. And I know there's other people who constantly pray. And we need to pray for others as well. 
It's this constant state of prayer until we build each other up. Each one of us is dependent on each other's prayers. When we tell someone we are going to pray for them, it needs to be more than just words. We need to commit ourselves to pray for others. I talked more about this on my last sermon about, about, about fellowship and how true fellowship causes us to pray for others. And we constantly need others to pray for us. And like Paul, we need to be willing to ask others to pray for us. Isn't that difficult? When you're in need and say, hey, can you just pray for me? It almost feels a little bit selfish, doesn't it? <laughs> because you have no idea what they're going through, but maybe ask them what they need prayer for as well. See, Paul is asking the Philippians for prayer, and that is what is so needful and so vital for us. We need to be praying for each other. That is the key that Paul is talking about here, having a right attitude. Paul then brings out another way that gives him the right attitude, gives him the right perspective. Paul keeps his view of eternity through the help of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we all have indwelling in us. Paul, again, he's, he's a great man, right? Paul was very well educated. He was well known throughout the early church. The Bible says that even the demons knew who Paul was. They admitted to it. That's how powerful he was. Yet, Paul didn't like doing anything under his own knowledge and power. See, so if we're going to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, that means we have to be in complete submission to Jesus Christ at all times. There is nothing that we can willingly allow in our life that we know is displeasing to Christ. We need to surrender it all to Christ. And when you come to know Christ is your Savior, right? You surrender your life to Christ. That's what that means. You're my Savior. I'm now going to follow you fully. And if you're going to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you need to surrender your life day by day, moment by moment. It's not a one-time deal. Every day when you wake up, God, I'm yours. Whatever you have for me to do today. I try to wake up that way every, every day. And this, this, this last week, to show you the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I had my week planned out already, and Jay texted me on Monday morning and said, hey, can you preach for me Sunday? Okay. <laughs> Little did either one of us know the next day he would be collapsing and would need me to probably preach anyway this Sunday because he would be out of commission for the next few days. And that was the guidance of the Holy Spirit guiding him and also telling, reminding me, you need to throw away your plans and follow mine. And every day I need to remind myself of that and sometimes God does that through outside sources. Now, Sorry, I just lost my spot here. Um, Paul here, this is, he knew that this was the key to the Christian life, right? That not going on in our own flesh, and our own power, it's, it's a supernatural life that we have once we surrender our life to Christ. It is a life of the power of the Holy Spirit that we're li living through. Paul knew that even with all his great learning and all his great abilities and all his great skills at being a missionary, that he still needed the power of the Holy Spirit to get all these things done. Paul says that these things will work out for his deliverance. Now, the, the word that Paul used here for deliverance is literally the word for salvation. Now, when we think about salvation, right, we think about the time we come to know Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior here on this earth. While that is salvation, the Bible speaks also of, of, of another salvation, when salvation is completed in you, right? And that comes in a future time when we are in heaven and we are made full and we are made complete. A time when we meet Jesus Christ face to face, that's an exciting time that I am looking forward to. Now, Paul says these things for him will work out at the time of great glorification, when he sees Jesus Christ face to face. And all these things will work out then. Now, he can rejoice how the circumstances will work out for his deliverance. 
His attitude through prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit is the right attitude. It gives him the proper eternal perspective. It is an attitude focused on Christ and not on what he's going through and not how he's feeling. Thirdly, Paul had a view of eternity because he was heavenly minded. Now, Paul thought of things of heaven. He was willing to look heavenward, and that is where he was focused. He, he was always focused on heaven. How did things affect eternity? Now, how many of you guys here like Shakespeare, like to read? <laughs> well, I, I, in, in high school, I never really understood why we read plays instead of watched them or acted them out. I mean, their plays are kind of hard to follow. But one that I really liked was, was Hamlet. Now, if, if you read Hamlet, you might, have, you might know or you might have even heard of the soliloquy, soliloquy Hamlet gives of the to be or not to be speech, right? In that speech, Hamlet is talking about how he's, he's kind of arguing with himself, you know, if, if I continue living, it's kind of bad, but if I die, I think it's going to be worse. <laughs> so Hamlet is, is going through these, these thoughts in his, his mind. Now, if you put that speech against what Paul is saying here, it's in stark contrast to what Paul is saying. And Hamlet kind of has like the earthly view, while Paul has the heavenly view. And Paul has a struggle, but his struggle is different. He's saying, man, departing is going to be so much better than departing or staying. And Paul looks at, at death as parting, and he's talking about the onward look to heaven. Paul is constantly has heaven in his mind. His joy comes from Christ. His, his life is wholly wrapped up in his relationship with Christ. For Paul, it means heaven means having a better relationship with Jesus. He can look at it as gain because his life is Christ. Heaven means a time closer to Christ. Yeah, that's part of his eternal perspective. It's part of his view of eternity. He knows his destiny is not in his own hands. See, if choice were left up to Paul, he would rather depart and be with Christ. For him, that would be gain. And Paul was not thinking of dying, but instead he was thinking of what lies ahead after his death. That deeper experience of what he already knew, he would know Christ more deeply. Like, can you imagine how, Paul, how close Paul was to Christ to, to have these thoughts? He was able to think of death as, as being with Christ. Now, we, we compare that to maybe how we often think of death. Especially now that I have kids, I'll often think of death. I, I might think of it how, how King David thought of death in the book of Psalms, where he says, God, you know, I, I just want to see my, my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. Right, we might, might think of it that way. Or he's saying, God, deliver me from the hands of death. Or we might think of it like, like King Hezekiah thought of death when he, he faced death. Like, God, just give me, give me 15 more years. I, 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 I give my life, but just give me more time here on this earth. Right, we, we kind of think of, of death as, oh, once that happens, I'm going to be missing out on all these things here on this earth. But not the Apostle Paul. He wasn't caught up in this life. He was so bound together with Jesus Christ that he could look at departing from this earth as his gain. He saw it as a closer relationship, being nearer to God. Now, Paul was hard-pressed between the two, right, and to depart with Christ or to stay here in earthly service. Because for Paul, life was Christ. We think of people here on this earth who consumed their lives with different things, right? We think of a businessman who's maybe always consumed with accumulating more wealth. That's what his life is based on. Or maybe somebody who is so deep into knowledge and academics where all they want to do is, is learn more, gain more knowledge. Or a politician might want to seek power or, or someone who's an actor, an actress, they, they might, their goal in life might be to see their name in lights or in the credits as the first name. But for Paul and for the Christian, our life is Christ. 
these things we do here on earth are for Christ. Ultimately, our life's consumed by Christ and are His. It should be our consuming passion. Everything we do should ultimately be for Christ. See, when, when Paul used the word depart, he was using it as, as a metaphor to depart with Christ. It was like a ship that departed from the dock, right? He's departing this earth, untying his moors, and going out into deeper waters where he wanted to be. Paul looked at death as departing from this earth and being with Christ, a new place. It wasn't some mystical place. It was just a new place to live. Now remember, the Bible says if we're believers, this isn't our home anymore. We're just docked here for a little while. We are only visiting here for a short time. We're only truly home when we are with Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't tell Don what song to sing this morning, but I thought the lyrics were appropriate, right? He says, our, our life is like a vapor in the wind, like a wave tossed in the ocean. And that's all we are. So why is it that so many of us, including myself, we have, just a, we have such a hard time with the ability to look heavenward? We need to have this heavenly outlook and look forward to Christ and, and look at death as the nearer presence with God, as a blessing. See, I think it's because so often it's because we get entangled by this world. We put our hands to the plow only to look back, only to begin a service with God and then do not finish it with full commitment. We get entangled in the world and believe the lies of what the world has to offer. I remember growing up and seeing cartoons, and maybe you have seen some movies like this, where you see a character in the middle of the desert, right, and he's really thirsty, and he starts seeing all these mirages around him, and he'll go foolishly chasing the mirage. It might be like a, a spring of water coming out, and he chases it, just to end up with a face full or a fist full of sand to find out that it's fake. Well, that's the same thing this world is offering us. It's just offering us mirages. And we go chase them thinking it's going to satisfy our thirst to find out it just makes us drier and it can ultimately end up killing us. The only thing that would truly satisfy us is the living water. Only Christ can satisfy. This is why I need to be looking heavenward at all times. See, Paul had the right attitude. Paul looked heavenward. But that was not all. He did not just keep his focus only there. See, Paul knew that he was still needed here in this earth, so he committed himself to earthly service because of his heavenly outlook. So fourthly, Paul had a great view of eternity, so he committed himself to earthly service. Paul was committed to earthly service while here on this earth. You may have heard the expression that someone is so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good, right? This, this is not what it's talking about. Those people are the, the kind of people that want to just escape this earth. They don't want to spend time with Jesus, right? They want to go to heaven maybe to see loved ones. They want to go to heaven because to, to, they have so many problems here on this earth. They think the world's going to hell in the handbasket. Get, get me out of here, God, right? They, that, they, they want to get to heaven. Well, in reality, if Jesus was the only person in heaven, and that was going to be you and him for eternity, that should be more than enough. Our relationship should be that close with him. And that, that, that's the longing Paul has, the longing that we should have. See, Paul had a heavenly mindset. He was committed to this earthly service, his heavenly mindset that caused him to commit himself to earthly service. Paul knew that he would be spending eternity in heaven, but... If that's eternity, right, his days here are numbered. And so he needed to make every single day count the same thing that we do. We only have a very short time here on this earth, and we need to make our life count for Jesus. The Bible says that night comes when no one can work. We know that in the whole scheme of things, our life is but a brief span. I was just talking to Amanda about this a few nights ago, and, and 
she quickly told me that I probably shouldn't counsel anybody who was feeling insignificant. <laughs> because I was just explaining to her that in the whole grand scheme of things, in the whole history of this world, our lives really don't matter much. I kind of had this revelation when I was about 16 years old and I used to go to Manhattan a lot with my parents in New York City and um, I was standing in the middle of New York City and there was millions of people all around me and I was like, wow, about 99.9% .9 of these people have no idea who I am and they could care less. <laughs> and that was just in one city. It really put me in my place very quickly. And then I thought, and those are the people that are just alive right now. How about all the people that have been alive in all of eternity? Now, if you think about that, how short your life is here, how insignificant it really is compared to everything, right? If you think about that and turn your coin over, look at the other side, then it really makes it amazing that an infinite God can actually care about such an insignificant and finite person such as me. Right? He has known every person that has walked his face of this earth. Yet, he still cares about me. So what better way to make my life here on earth have purpose than to make every day as a service to God? The one who made me. The one who cares that much about me. See, we need to commit ourselves to make the most of every moment that we have. We need to make our life count for service here on this earth. That is how we'll keep a view of eternity because we know that all that we do is for Christ. That is how we will know fullness and joy in our Christian life when we, when we make our life count by serving God here on this earth. It is a call for commitment and a call to involvement. Paul's purpose in remaining here on earth was to give service. He said that remaining here on earth would mean fruitful labor for him. He would be visiting his Philippian friends again and encouraging them in the ways of Christ. See, there was more to Christianity than just anticipating the glory of heaven. There's this lost world around us. There's so many just outside of the doors of this building that need us. They need to hear about Jesus. It is part of having a view of eternity to have a great service here on this earth. This is a call out for Christians to get their hands dirty. Paul was talking about this kind of commitment to earthly service. Paul uses the word here, remain. Now the word to remain means to be called alongside to be a helper. So for him to remain on earth meant to be a servant. So I'll end with this. How is your service here on earth? Is your life committed to others and to Jesus? See, it makes a difference how you live your life on earth. We, we all need to serve some way whether it's opening our, our homes to strangers or, or serving the community or becoming friends with our neighbor or coworker so that we can share the gospel with them. We need to know that eternity is at stake for everyone and that we just have a short time here. We have no idea how long we're going to be here. I could walk out this door and get hit by a car. Don't put off to tomorrow what you could do today. It says, only one life will soon pass. Only what is done for Christ will last. So won't you make your life count for Christ? Let's live in view of eternity and use every moment we have for the service of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you again for giving us your holy word. Lord, I, I thank you for giving us just um, awesome examples, such as the Apostle Paul, 
who truly followed you, Lord, and live by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father God, the same power that's living in us. I pray that we would commit our lives every day to follow you, to guide us, Lord, that we won't live by our own understandings, but we will be open to what you have to say to us, Lord, that we will be willing to take those steps, even when they don't make sense at times. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for choosing us and for calling us your own. And I pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen.